All righty. How y'all doing? Have you uh, had a chance to play with the watches yet? How many have totally bricked theirs and had to reload it? Cass, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> uh, I, I have left mine. So last year I had my badge, right, and I left it programmable. And, you know, at one of the social events, and I kept seeing people, like, their heads down, then they'd look over at my badge, and then they'd head their heads down, they'd look back over, they completely bricked it. You know, so just kind of hacking it. So don't leave them out pro uh, programmable. All right, so uh, the Bengal JS, we are so happy to be able to, um, to have uh, been able to bring this uh, to you. It's been a, 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 a bit of hard work for, for a while. We spent like six hours just today flashing all these things uh, uh, for you all. Uh, so we're, 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 we're super happy to, uh, to have been able to get this. There we go. Um, developer information, um, nodewatch.dev. Uh, for apps, you want to go to bangaljs.com uh, uh, apps. Uh, there were a certain percentage of the badges when we were flashing and that apparently had some errors in the JavaScript code. If you, if you run into those, just go to bangaljs and reload the app. Uh, and, it should, and it should work from, uh, work from there. Let's see here. That's not gonna, no, that's not going to go again. Uh, we do have TensorFlow. Some of you might have seen this uh, uh, on there. Tensor, TensorFlow Lite is running on the watch. So we have machine learning models that can run, some uh, gesture recognition. You're going to see, you know, it's going to take some playing around with um, on this thing, but, you know, we're, we're really super excited about this. It's not sending any data up, you know, to anything. It's all running completely on the watch. Uh, the team uh, that, that put this together, super happy, uh, super proud of the team here. Uh, Gordon, and Connor, and uh, Andreas did the overwhelming majority of the work on the software, uh, particularly around TensorFlow and getting that, uh, getting that up and running. Uh, we've had uh, uh, Agata designed all of the the graphics, the box for it. Uh, Aideen helped us with the uh, with you know with the marketing, and Glenn helped us put together the uh, uh, the website and the content there. Super happy uh, with, with the work that the team has done, uh, and we're fantastic. So that's all I have to say. Um, I want to hand it over to Gordon to talk about the details on the watch itself. So I'm going to get out of here and let him talk. Brilliant. Thanks. Great. Okay, um, James is actually being really modest because he did loads of the work on, on the apps for, for Bangladesh as well. Um, so, yeah, who was here last year? Out of... Okay, so it's a reasonable turnout, yeah. Um, so last year we had um, these things which are... Um, they were the NodeConf badges. They had uh, an LCD screen a few lights kind of behind the screen, up and down, and, um, and you could program them in Bluetooth. And this year, we wanted to do something kind of different, but also a little bit the same. So obviously, you've seen the watch now. Um, it's actually the same JavaScript interpreter um, running on it, and it's also hackable, but an awful lot is different. For instance, it is a watch. Um, we managed to get TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers on it, um, it's actually got a GPS built into it, heart rate monitor, um, a lot of other stuff that you would expect from a watch. And it's waterproof, which last year's badge was not. Um, I don't know if anyone found that out. But, um, so in this year, um, there's a small plug, but you can actually get more of them. Um, because as of this morning, they are on Kickstarter. Um, what you've got is very much a kind of um, early release of the software. So Hopefully, over the conference and over the course of um, the next few months and even year, everything will get much smoother, much faster, um, much more interesting. Um, so James has already covered, um, but I'm sure a few of you won't really want to listen to me that much. So go to nowwatch.dev. There's loads of stuff there about how to get started. Um, so the watch itself has, um, it's actually the same microcontroller as last year. It's a ARM Cortex-M4 running at about 64 megahertz. Um, it's got Bluetooth low energy built into it, but it's only got 64K of RAM, which poses a bit of a problem when the display is 240 by 240 by 16 bits. It's actually got twice as much RAM in the display as the microcontroller has. Um, so yeah, it's got, um, all the other sensors and things. It's also got a big, a big flash chip, big for an embedded device of four megabytes. Inside, um, I know Cass has already taken hers to bits. 
but um, uh, you can basically just unscrew it and out comes this little um, module, which has got the display on top, the, um, the mic controller underneath. On the back side, you've got the um, heart rate monitor and, um, and the little piezo speaker. And this whole thing, you can kind of take it to bits um, quite carefully and, and put it back together and the whole watch will stay totally waterproof and you can mess around with it if you want to. Um, this is not the first watch we came across. This is a um, small selection of my watch graveyard of various watches that I have tried to port this to, have ported it to and then realized no one will sell me the watches. Um, have ported to and found I can't get the firmware on in a, in a decent way. Um, so it's been kind of a, quite a long process. Um, it turns out that very few of the watch manufacturers that make nice watches that have a bunch of stuff on, like GPS, will actually give you any of the designs for them either. So um, we've actually had to go through, dismantle the watch, look at everything under a microscope, reverse engineer exactly where all the pins go, um, actually get firmware, disassemble it, um, and yeah, just figure out how to make everything work. And hopefully the end result of this is that after this work, you won't have to worry about any of this stuff. It should just be available for JavaScript. One of the things we have managed to do, as has been covered already, is get TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers on here. So you can actually just instantiate it from JavaScript, um, load up a model over the air, and run it. We've got it running with gestures. Um, Andreas has put a huge amount of work into this, um, and he's made this really neat Google Colab that you can go to, you can add gesture data, and you can build your own model in the browser. Um, so, because everything was such a ridiculous rush to get things done, we actually forgot to put the language model in your, so the, um, the gesture model into your watches. So, um, if you go to the workshop, there'll be like information on that. I will try and release an app on the app thing that we can, we can load it up with. Um, but yeah, at the moment you can just move your hand and it's only trained on like two people, so it's a bit, bit glitchy. So what we need is a whole bunch of gestures from a different people and hopefully, like if you guys are willing, by the end of the conference we'll have a whole, whole load of gestures to train it on and we'll have a much better model to work with. So um, this has come up. Um, I've heard someone has asked this question already. Are we tracking you? And we're, we're most definitely not. Um, so Bluetooth is off by default. No data is gathered. Um, and all the code is available on the GitHub repository if you don't believe us. Um, so this, um, the watch itself is running this Esprino JavaScript interpreter. If you've never come across it before, it's a... Um, JavaScript interpreter designed for very low-end devices. So, um, you know, V8 is far more efficient on a CPU cycle basis, but um, it uses an awful lot of memory just to start off with. And when you've only got 64K of RAM in total and you've got to run your JavaScript, you've got to have the JavaScript code you execute in that as well, um, you really have to have something that's quite efficient. So it skips out a few things from ES5, but most of the stuff that you would expect to be there is there. And it's also got some fun things from ES6 as well. Uh, again, you can check it out in sprino.com forward slash features. Um, so we said it was hackable. Um, the USB is just two pin, it's only for charging. So you can program it with Bluetooth. And we're just using web Bluetooth. So the whole IDE for programming this, the whole app store is just HTML, JavaScript, CSS, nothing else to it. Um, Web Bluetooth is part of Chromium, so it's now in Chrome, Opera, and Edge. The operating system support is pretty good. It should just work on most operating systems. I mean, on Linux, it just works as much as anything just works on Linux. Um, and on iOS, you have to have an app because, unfortunately, it's not part of Safari, um, and if you can, if you then go to the WebBLE app, which is a not free but cheap app, you view the web page through that, it will actually have added um, the Web Bluetooth API into the, um, into the web view. And WebBLE is actually open source, so um, you can use it. 
without having to, um, to pay the pound or two it costs if, if you need to compile your own. Um, yeah, you can, you can also use it with Node.js. There are packages that, that wrap um, the Noble API up into Web Bluetooth, so you can experiment with that. And the watch itself runs Web Bluetooth. So if you, for instance, got some Web Bluetooth code that controls a light bulb, you can basically take that, you can run it directly on your watch, and you can then control the light bulb from your watch without having to have any phone or other computer involved in that transaction. So to get connected, um, you just have to tap the middle button, which brings up a menu, um, go down to settings, and in settings, you scroll down all the way to make connectable. It may not be um, entirely obvious right now that there are more items in that setting this menu, because there's no kind of continuation icon, but, um, but there are more down there. When you've hit make connectable, it will display something like this. Um, the name up the top is the name that should appear in your web browser when you are trying to connect to it. So um, if you go to the app loader website, uh, you click on the upload button by an app that you want, you'll see this little web Bluetooth menu. Um, and again, this should work on your, on your phone as well. Just choose it, click pair, the spinny icon will spin for a while and hopefully you will then end up with the application on your, on your watch. But the whole app loader site is just on GitHub. Um, it's very, very easy to add stuff to it. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, over the course of the conference and the workshop, um, you should be able to, um, to see how to add things to it. And, and the app store should hopefully get a lot more apps by the end of the conference. Um, this is the repository. Again, it'll be linked from, from nodewatch.dev. Um, as a quick example, this is the code needed to do a speedometer. And you can see it's, it's mostly just code that draws to the screen. Um, the actual code needed to get the GPS fix is just a few lines. Um, set GPS power and um, bangle dot on GPS. And that's enough to, um, to get the reading. So for simple apps, you should be able to have a lot of fun just playing around. Um, so how do you actually get it on the watch? In the same way as you went to the um, uh, you went to the app store, um, you just go to svno.com forward slash IDE. You get an IDE like this. Um, you click the connect button at the top left, click web Bluetooth, um, and then you choose your, um, your bangle device. Now, on the left of the IDE, you've got a REPL. Um, this is actually literally just sending each character you type to the watch, and then the result is getting replied to you. So you've got kind of a complete view into the watch. You can execute a command like bangle.buzz, and it will be executed straight away, and your, your watch will vibrate. Um, so, yeah, if you see anything wrong with documentation, if you've got an app, no matter how small you think it is, please just issue a PR for it. It would be great to get a whole load more stuff um, in the watch. If you broke it, um, if you've been developing on it, you will find that obviously nothing um, normally displays. If you just long press the, uh, the bottom right button, it will hopefully reset the device and it will load back the original clock. If you've completely changed stuff, that may not work. Um, so there's this code to get it a bit better. Uh, and again, this is all on nodewatch.dev, but you can, um, you can get it to boot up without loading any JavaScript code. You can then go to the App Store, you can erase all the JavaScript and start reloading just the JavaScript code that you want. Um, so that should be pretty good, but if you really, really broke it, um, just, just come and see one of us, and we're more than happy to help. If you've got any questions at all, um, let us know. So there is a workshop this afternoon about um, making these, these applications and about using the TensorFlow Lite for micro, microcontrollers. Um, so because of this huge kind of watch graveyard you saw earlier, um, these watches didn't run JavaScript six weeks ago, and it's been this kind of massive struggle to, um, 
to, to get it all working. If I look like I have been living in a cave for the last six weeks, I actually have. I have just been trying really hard to get these things working. So there may well be some rough edges, so please bear with us. Um, if you see anything wrong, um, yeah, just, just let us know. We'll, we'll do our best to fix it. And the applications will probably keep, um, keep being improved over the course of the, um, course of the conference as well. If you like this, please have a look at the Kickstarter campaign. Um, we're hoping to ship like the main lot in March. It should be a lot quicker, but um, given like how much of a hassle it's been to get things for this conference, we're trying to play it safe and make sure we, we get everything on time. Um, there's also Espino.com with a load of information about um, other Espino devices and stuff on the previous NodeConf badges. And you'll find that, like the NodeConf badge from last year, it's still receiving updates um, because it uses a Pixel.js firmware. So if you've got it um, from last year, take it out, have a play with it when you get home. Um, you should find some much more interesting stuff. And um, there's even the possibility to compile TensorFlow for it if you want to. Um, so yeah, that's me done. And I'm afraid I'm a, I'm a little bit early. But um, if because I've got some time, we could, if anyone's got any questions. If anyone has any questions, uh, you can go and just raise your hand. I'll come over to you with a microphone. Uh, well, to get started, so I, I have a, one question to kind of throw out there. Uh, so you mentioned that you know, you're accepting PRs, that there's a lot of rough edges. Are there any uh, like known rough edges that you could use help on, if there's anyone here who's like really enterprising and wants to get started right away? Um, so, oof. I mean, just like, obviously, small apps. Um, someone mentioned there's, there's no timer, nothing like that. Um, the, the app loading website itself as well, um, currently there's, there's no filtering on there. It's a very, very basic website using Spectre CSS. Um, so, like, th there's a lot of stuff that could be done just to make the user interface much, much nicer and much more friendly. If anyone's up for, for trying to give it a go, that would be, it would be amazing, it'd be really good. Um, hey, uh, you mentioned that you reverse engineered the, the chipset and, or, or some of the, 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 the boards inside the watch to be able to run JavaScript on it, and, and that then we didn't have to do that. Um, it, it would be really cool to know how you did that. Like, that would be a great talk. W yeah. Will that be something that's covered in the workshop, or uh, it just sounds super interesting? It, I, I didn't have any plans to do that. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know whether there'd, there'd be a way to, um, to do it for this node conf, but um, I'll, I'll be trying to do some kind of, of blog post on it, I guess, later. Um, maybe next node conf. <laughs> Um, but it's actually, um, there's a tool called, I'm probably mispronouncing this, Gydra, which um, will take a binary file, will disassemble it, and it will actually decompile as well. So it will try and come up with the C code that it think, thinks generated um, that, that actual assembler. And it's, this, it, it's, it's actually been quite a, a fun thing to do. Um, like, you've got all this code, and you've got you don't know anything apart from where the, um, the chip enters it and where it calls into it for some specific things, but you know addresses of I.O. pins in memory. So you kind of figure out where it's accessing those addresses, and then you work back and you're like, oh, that I.O. pin was the one to turn the heart rate monitor on, maybe, and then you can figure out all the rest of the heart rate monitor stuff around that. Um, so it's, it's been quite exciting. By the third watch, it was getting less, less fun to do. But it's, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and do it in more detail. Thank you. Um, if you're planning on coming to the workshop later, is there any like prerequisite or like sh something we should check to make sure everything works before showing up? That way it saves time when you get to the workshop. Yeah, yeah, so that's a really good, um, good thing. If, uh, if you can get the uh, Bangle app loader working on your laptop, or the web IDE. So if, if one works, the other one should work. But if you can get connected with them, that would be great. Um, on any new Macs, you should be fine. And I guess that's probably like 90% of you. 
Um, on, on Windows, you should be, Windows 10, you should be fine with, um, with Chrome, but, um, but have a look and try. Uh, and yeah, any questions getting going, um, you can ask us in the workshop or just try and catch one of this beforehand. There's Connor there, there's James um, and Glenn as well and, and Cass. Um, yeah, so yeah. Right. Does anyone else have any uh, questions? Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. And I have one uh, pressing question. Uh, can it run Doom? <laughs> <laughs> it would be um, not in JavaScript, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, I think it probably could with a bit of work. Um, we'll see, maybe someone can have a go. <laughs> um, so actually, um, having said that, uh, while it may not run Doom as is, um, you can run, uh, you can actually put C code into the web IDE. It will send it off to web service. It will compile it using GCC, and then it will upload that code and will run it on the watch. So it's entirely possible that you could get a kind of usable Raycaster going, uh, going with it. Um, so that would be quite a, a fun project. Thanks. Um, I heard that V8 did some work on a light version um, that uses a lot less memory. Uh, I don't know if you know anything Sorry, about that. V8 did? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't, I'd heard about it, but I probably don't know any more about it than you do. Um, but there is, like, you know, by default, V8 allocates megabytes of buffers. Um, and they can make it light and bring it down to, like, you know, 100k of buffers, but unfortunately that's still, still. that's still gonna be a bit too much. But, um, so, you know, technology obviously moves on quite a lot. And when I started, um, devices with 64k six years ago were definitely mid to high range. Now they're definitely mid to low range. Um, and you can get watches. One of the first watches we were looking at for the conference had 256k of RAM. So at some point very soon, the trade-offs in the Esprino interpreter to, to make it work well for those low-end devices won't really make sense on the high-end devices. And we'll have to look at changing the JavaScript engine behind it. Um, and it may be that if V8 is coming down in, um, in memory consumption, then yeah, at some point they may meet and I may end up using V8 for it. All right, do we have any more questions? Yes. You mentioned uh, five weeks ago it didn't run JavaScript. What was it running originally? Uh, so it's actually, um, it's a Chinese watch from DT number one. Uh, now I don't remember what the firmware is actually called, but it needed a Android app called the H plus app. Um, and I remember it being a very scary experience of installing this kind of no name Chinese app from an APK and it going, can I have access to your call history? Um, your emails, your, all your notifications, um, and it's, it's quite a scary thing. So, yeah, so basically it was, it was really nice hardware, but the software was actually, um, it was completely inflexible and really very limited with what it could do. So hopefully this makes it into a much more fun, interesting device. Thanks. Hey Gordon, this is Tanda. Uh, you, you know me from the forums. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned on the side in the total description that you are actually running a business out of this. Could you spend a few words on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, uh, I've been doing this full time for probably about six years now, uh, and everything is entirely open source. Uh, I started off, I, I did a so this is now the fourth Kickstarter campaign, and I did the Kickstarter sort of six years ago. Um, and at the end of that, everything was made open. And basically, I, um, I sell hardware that runs the software that I make. Now, there are about 40 different boards, I think, that are supported by Esprino, and I make six of those, I think. 
Um, but there are some that cost you know, less than a pint of beer, like, like the ESP8266. You can order it on eBay, and you can get it shipped to you for four pounds or something. Um, so there's this interesting side of it where you've got a bunch of people, and I, I believe you use ESP8266 a lot, don't you, I think? Um, uh, that can use the free version, and then I try and maintain the, um, sort of, I, I half maintain those, but I mainly try and make sure that it works really well on ones that I sell. And I'm kind of just dependent on goodwill a lot, and hopefully the fact that a lot of people will prefer to buy the version that just works and has it all pre-installed than, um, than to spend time with um, uh, installing the firmware, maybe compiling their own version, um, putting it on another device. But it's, it's always this interesting balance because hackers always do want to save um, money at the expense of their own time. So you find that, I think now it's probably only about a third of the boards that are running Estrino are actually boards that I'm selling. All the rest of them are, um, uh, are ones just using the open source versions of software on some other board. Um, yeah, and it's, it's been, been really interesting. It's, it's a bit of a challenge trying to kind of set the tone right so that, um, uh, so that you encourage people to buy your boards, but you don't put people off who, um, who would just want to use the free version. Um, but, I mean, it's been really good, and I think I'm probably quite lucky in, in that, you know, I've been able to run an open source business and pay myself a sort of standard salary, not as much as I get properly working in industry, but enough to survive, and I can work from home, and I can do what I really enjoy doing. Thanks. I think that's probably me sorted. Thanks.